My first guest is a poet, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and a former U.S. Poet Laureate. Here's Natasha Trethaway. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Uh, in reading your poems and in watching on YouTube, and everybody should do it, there's several speeches or lectures that you gave as Poet Laureate uh, that are excellent. There was, there's so much I want to ask, but I want to start with something very basic. And that's in, in, I think it was in a lecture you gave, in which you talked about the necessity of poetry. And so that, is that for society? Is it for the individual? Is it for both? And if it's for the individual, how do we all get there hmm. if we're not there? Well, I absolutely think it's for both. Um, I have actually said, I think, in some of those lectures that I think poetry might be the thing that saves us. Um, poetry is a way for us both as um, a society as well as individuals to connect to each other across time and space, to be reminded of how we are alike and not that we are different. The intimacy of a single voice speaking to another that um, makes you feel like you're entering a space that um, is welcoming. I think, how do we get there as individuals? I mean, I, I, I imagine that one of the things you might be asking is, like, why should anybody read any poetry? Or if, there, if people don't read poetry, how do we get there as individuals thinking that it's something that should be a necessity or matter for yeah. us? Yeah, and I think it's a little bit like when I was reading your books, I realized, quickly that I had to slow down. Mm. And I'm so used to reading the magazine or New York Times and just being like, got it, got it, got it, graph, 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 and it's written that way. And even the spacing of the words on the page in, in your poetry and obviously other poems mm -hmm. makes you say, hey, wait a minute, buddy, slow down. And that's hard, that's hard to do. Oh, well, that's right. I mean, poetry does ask that we slow down and be more observant um, and more empathetic. It, it, it sounds like you were reading it the right way, um, because there is a way that yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a way that you know, <laughs> you you can read you could read poetry quickly. I mean, lots of poems, I, and I think mine are like this, aim to be accessible on the surface so that you can, you know, quickly sort of read what's going on on a surface level. But you're right, there is something that's saying to you, there's more than that and that you have to read differently when you read a poem and you slow down and think about what else the words mean. If you're sort of reading always on that kind of uh, primary definition in the OED level, then you're not really reading a poem because you gotta go secondary, tertiary, and on and on and think yeah, about the figurative yeah, levels. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, of course, I mean, and, and the way that a poem does that is by slowing you down with line breaks and space and breath and the way that, you know, when you're really sort of taking the poem into your body, you're taking it not only in your intellect and heart, but you're taking it with breath and um, with the rhythm that you might tap out if you hear it with your foot. You mentioned something about kind of poetry having the ability to cross time. Mm -hmm. And so many of your poems and so many of the overall themes of the collections are making connections between present, perhaps your life, perhaps not, and, and the past. And past in sometimes surprising ways. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've read many, many poems. You read them, if you read them in isolation, it might just be about, it could be about this, the mug on this desk, and it could be absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. But what is it about memory and the complexities of memory that, that obviously like, inspires you so much? Well, I think what I'm interested in in terms of the complexities of memory, of course, we know that um, as we remember things, as we tell stories about our own experience over and over again, we're re-remembering them every single time. And because of that, they're, they're changing a little bit. Um, we see that right now with cultural memory. Um, I feel like when I was working on Native Guard, um, I was thinking very much about historical memory, cultural memory, um, the stories that we tell ourselves as a, a group, as a culture, about the past. And here we see ourselves having debates about our past, 
Um, that's what Charlottesville is about. That's what all these uh, debates about uh, Civil War, uh, post-Civil War monuments and monuments to the Confederacy are all about. Memory, how we're going to remember and what story our memories are going to tell about us as a, as a nation. So you're from, or spent a lot of your early life in the Mississippi Gulf area, mm -hmm. Gulfport. Mm -hmm. You've spent a lot of your life in the, in the South, including the Deep South. Mm -hmm. You've talked about how Gulfport and Mississippi, on the one hand, has been a place of such ugliness, and yet you still love it. Well, I, I love my South. Um, it's the place that made me. Um, I don't think I'd be a writer without all of the complexities and the trauma and the very ongoing difficult things about this place that I both love and have every reason if I'm a smart person, yeah. to hate. You say Mississippi, and you were quoting Auden, mm -hmm. I believe, and I would never know, how, know that unless you had actually quoted Auden and told me you were doing that. Um, but you said Mississippi hurt you into poetry. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Auden said to, about Yeats that Mad Ireland hurt him into poetry. Certainly, my, the madness of my Mississippi and my South, um, with its sort of terrible history of injustice and racism. But, you know, in a larger sense, our, our whole nation hurt me into poetry. Um, Why was poetry the avenue for you? You know, sometimes that I feel like I, that's a hard question to answer. And it, it, it may depend on when you ask it what I might say. So I'm answering it for the first time, I think, again. Okay. Um, I think a lot of people turn to poetry because it seems like a kind of special, um, sacred even, language that feels different than the ordinary language that we use to communicate with each other. People who may never read poetry will turn to poetry in difficult moments or in moments of extreme joy, moments when they want to try to convince the beloved of their devotion uh, to commemorate the birth of a child, they turn to poetry because somehow poetry announces itself as special. And this is where you have to turn because no other language is going to be able to do it. I turned to poetry when my mother was murdered when I was 19. I hadn't been a poet yet. Um, in fact, I, I tended to write short stories back then. But it wasn't a story that I needed to write to try to contend with that feeling of grief. It was a poem. It was a bad poem. But I only believe, I believe that only poetry could contain something of that grief. And that's been a subject that you've, that you've relied on poetry. You've come back to it. You've come back to the story of, I mean, that's what Native Guard. Native Guard is, is both about a a regiment, uh, an all-black regiment in the Civil War, and it's about wrestling with, with your mom's life and, and obviously her brutal death. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is an intertwining of those two things, about um, national and personal memory, and about one's native duty as the child of a woman, to remember her and one's native duty as a citizen to remember truthfully the history of our nation. On a lighter note, you were the <laughs> National Poet Laureate. What's that gig like? Is, do you go into an office? Are there benefits? Like, <laughs> what's, how does that work? Well, you know, so that no one complains, the first thing I need to say is that it is not paid for by anyone's taxes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Poet Laureateship is endowed by a private, uh, the, the, what, whatever small budget there is, is um, an, a private endowment. Okay. And that's just for programming, if I want to put on yeah. readings or something like that at the library. Um, you know, before it became the laureateship, which happened in um, 1986, Congress changed the title of it. It used to just be the consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress. And that was a real job. It was a, a librarian's position. Yeah. But when they changed it, it just became this kind of honorary position. 
Um, and the laureate wasn't asked to do anything in particular except sort of be an advocate for poetry in America and give a reading to open the library season, uh, one to close it at the end, um, and choose uh, some poets to win a, 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 an award. But in my first term, I decided to, to kind of be old school, and I was, I was thinking about Gwendolyn Brooks, because Gwendolyn Brooks of Chicago was the last consultant. Um, and she was in her office every day. She wrote letters uh, responding to all the child, school children who wrote to her. So I decided to move to Washington for half a year and take up residence there and hold office hours in the Library of Congress so I could meet with the public to talk about poetry. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, well, thank you so much for meeting with us. Thank you. Natasha Trethewey, everyone. Thank you.